when you go on YouTube, like YouTube growth niche, this niche, I, I feel like there's kind of split into two camps. So the first camp is the regular people doing entertainment channel. And then there's the new category, which is what we're doing is how to use YouTube for. Today, we are talking to Helmi Hassan, a YouTube strategist and coach teaching people how to get more organic leads from their YouTube channel. You know, everybody want immediate results and they just focus on going viral all the time, which I don't think is, it shouldn't be your only strategy. It should be part of your strategy, but not the only thing. While teaching this on X and YouTube, one of Helmi's recent videos that teaches this exact thing has just gone viral. You don't need to edit like Mr. Beast. You can get away by being uh, editing very simple, but being... So in this conversation, we talk about why every business should have a YouTube channel at the top of their funnel for more leads and sales. If you just focus on viral stuff, like top level, top funnel stuff, you will go around maybe. But when people, you know, they, they check you out, that's the only thing you have. You don't appear to be the guy that they should hire. Stay tuned for YouTube insights you won't find anywhere else. This is the Play Start podcast where we talk about everything YouTube growth. Um, yeah, so hi, how's it, how's it going everybody? My name is Helmi. Um, I didn't always start at YouTube. I started my career as an engineer first. I was designing uh, mechanical stuff uh, in Singapore. That was what I, I did originally. Um, in 20, 2014, I think, I started SEO blogging. Um, so the reason I started SEO blogging was at the time I had an Airbnb business. I was renting out apartments in Kuala Lumpur. So I wanted to target digital nomads to book my place. So that's why I started to write best cafes to work in Kuala Lumpur, uh, top 10 things to do, that kind of stuff. So there's stuff people search. So uh, the, the trend of blogging at the time was people people who blog, they they kind of move towards YouTube. So every so I joined a SEO blogging kind of course. Everybody was moving to to YouTube because there's massive search traffic there, and it makes sense because if you're used to doing search traffic on 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 text, people you know they want to do that on on video as well. So that's exactly what I did. I started YouTube, but um, because the business closed due to pandemic, I kind of changed my website from Airbnb to uh, personal finance. It was just a topic I I generally like, and at the during the pandemic, I have nothing to do, basically. Um, nobody was hiring and that kind of stuff. So I did a lot of content about personal finance. Uh, it's stuff that very basic. And I noticed that people don't really want super in-depth stuff. It's just, you know, it, it's stuff like your, your father should be teaching you, but not everybody yeah. has that kind of father. You, you know what I'm saying? Doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like how to pick the best credit cards, how to see if this property is okay to buy. It's very basic stuff. And then people like that, it's very conversational. So they feel like I'm their friend. And I noticed that does really well. So anyways, um, from there, I I got hired. Somebody somebody in Malaysia, like they have a media company. They they, they found me. Um, I, I was originally like a content, lead of content. Uh, basically, I, I helped them with creating content for them, their website, their YouTube channel. Uh, then I got another job from this local media company. They were reviewing cars. So they're, they're a website that owns, uh, that, that sells used cars. So they have a YouTube channel reviewing cars, right? So I work as a head of content there for a very short time, but it didn't work out because uh, the company was run like an old media company. Like their, their mentality and everything is very old school, which is completely different than YouTube. YouTube is very new, right? So sometimes it's very hard for them. Like they, these guys, they work for, they, you know, they're typical journalists. They're, they're very proud of very technical stuff, but the audience doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Right, so that's why I see that there's a difference between what I do as a YouTuber and what the market who's struggling to try and adapt to YouTube. So from there, I I kind of launched this new YouTube channel, um, YouTube Funnels, which is a brand new channel, uh, completely different than uh, the the personal finance one. So this channel is just teaching other business owners how to get clients using YouTube. So it's specifically for business owners. It's not for like people who are in the entertainment industry. I don't really. I don't really relate to those guys and I can't really teach them much because it's very different. For me, I only have 3,000 subscribers. I already make a full-time income. So I, I attract people like me, like, hey, you don't really need to go super viral all the time, right? You want to sell something. You want to have something to sell. You use YouTube to promote that. So in other words, if I want to, you know, that's my service, I have to kind of have proof that I do that myself, which is also the reason why I have that new YouTube channel. And I did ma make clients and... And when my clients see that, hey, this guy got clients because of YouTube, they they book a call with me, and that's how I get my clients. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it's kind of a similar strategy that PlayStack have gone through as well, where 
on YouTube, you've got a lot of YouTube growth strategies, which is great. They help you uh, grow your channel, get more views. But the I think the the difference between what we both do is we focus not just on views, but we focus on turning those views into meetings books, into leads, into sales. Because at the end of yeah. the day, views are just, in many ways, just a vanity metric. Subscribers are just a vanity yeah. metric. And what businesses care about is how much money is your YouTube channel making you. Um, yeah. So I think that that's quite a, an important distinction that we yeah. focus on, not just the getting views, but also the funnel as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting you say that because in my, from my point of view, when you go on YouTube, like YouTube growth niche, this niche, I, I feel like there's kind of split into two camps. So the first camp is the regular people doing entertainment channel. So they're the guys who want to know how to go viral, how to make money on ads. The YouTube automation guys, they fall under this category. And then there's the new category, which is what we're doing is how to use YouTube for business, which I think not a lot of people are actually talking about. Yeah, not yet for sure. And so um, you started this new channel three months ago. Was that an immediate um, effect where you were getting clients from there or was that also like a slow grind? And and obviously the, one of the things I want to talk about is like one of your videos actually went viral, what kind of accelerated yeah. and emphasized the the effect of YouTube for a business, right? So I kind of want to talk through that uh, experience that you went through. Yeah, so when I started the channel, uh, at the time, I had two decisions. Either I use my old channel, Personal Finance, I already have about 8,000 subscribers and just rebrand. Or I, I need to start a completely new channel, which I think works better for the algorithm, but it's a ton of work to you know start from scratch. Um, you know, I paid some consultation and from other people and stuff like that. So I decided I want to try something new. So when I launched the new channel, um, I didn't really see any results for three months, if I'm honest with you. So... And then I have a content strategy. Um, so I feel like your content itself has a funnel. So there's people at the bottom stage, uh, you want to prove your competence. And then there's the people at the middle stage where you do a lot of how-to videos. And then people at the top stage, those are for you to get discovered. So basically the viral content goes on that top level. So I started from the bottom up. So when you start from the bottom up, case studies, client testimonials, how-to, you don't get a lot of views. And a lot of people will quit at this point. But I, I don't know, I, I kind of believe in my process and I and I start from bottom and then how to's and then I, I started to talk about something a little bit more broad and that's when I went viral. And when I did went viral, people like the video, they go to my channel, they're like, hey, I like this guy. I look at the links, book a call. And then they look at, you know, I have how to's like, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And then I have client testimonials. So from their point of view, this guy seems like he's the real deal. And then th I think that's how I get a lot of book calls. So if I didn't start with the uh, you know client testimonials, the how tos, and then I went straight to just viral content, maybe I do go viral. But then people go check me out. I'm like, what is this channel about? Like, there's nothing there except for viral stuff. So you appear to be just another viral channel. But in my case, I appear to be oh, this guy wants to help business owners grow, and then he has all these proof, you know. And then that's how I got the book calls. Yeah, but this process takes a long time. So a lot of people don't like it because they, they, you know, everybody want immediate results and they just focus on going viral all the time, which I don't think is, it shouldn't be your only strategy. It should be part of your strategy, but not the only thing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And we experience the same thing where we're talking to prospects or we're talking to clients and they want to know how many views we can get them within a week or within a month or within two months. And it's like, well, YouTube doesn't really work like that. It's a long-term play, which I, I you know, I, I don't blame them. I, I understand my like, businesses need an ROI fast to justify the the money that they're spending. Um, but I mean, you're, you're kind of like proof that it does take a little bit of time. Like it took you three months, I think, to get your first kind of viral video. And then after that video, it kind of like your whole channel was now on a new level. It's like the base level of yeah. views after that viral video yeah. is a lot higher yeah. now. Um, and yeah. so that's how you, you grow a YouTube channel. But a lot of people give up in the first one, two, three months. But um, yeah, yeah, it really is just a long-term game. If I'm honest, I almost gave up as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so uh, yeah. uh, like, because you need to build that foundation, right? Like, um, I, like Mike was saying, like we struggle to usually we lock in people for a longer amount of time or try to so that we can get those results because of that. Like we can't get started with viral content because that wouldn't do anything for the business. So like you mentioned before, is like you need to build like every YouTube channel for a business 
needs to build that foundation of case studies, testimonials, all the stuff that won't get us many views. And so it's really tough to to go that way. But how do you convince someone that that should be the content that they should start with? Like, how do you position that? Oh, um, for me, I, I get my potential clients on a call, free call. And then that's where I ask them, like, what are you trying to build and that kind of stuff. And if I can help them or not. And then um, I, I just say, hey, this is the content strategy you have to do. I, you know, I have a diagram. I, I show, I just share my screen. This is the showing your competence. And then you got to start how to's and then you got to start this. And then I just show my, my channel, proof in the pudding. And then they understand from that because I actually did it. So I think a lot of people who have struggled with this is because, probably because you never did it yourself. That's probably why. So because I've done it and then they've been following me since I wasn't even, like I had two followers. They've been following me, right? And uh, they've seen it. Oh, this guy blew up in like three months, but he's he before that three months, he did so many things and none of them really stick uh, or whatever, but he actually has a strategy. So that gives people, you know, an idea like, oh, you shouldn't just do viral thing all the time. And then I, and then I, it's exactly what I just said to you. If you just focus on viral stuff, that like top level, top funnel stuff, you will go viral maybe. But when people, you know, they, they check you out, that's the only thing you have. You don't appear to be the guy that they should hire, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so what is your YouTube channel, your main kind of lead generation? Is that when, is that how you get most of your clients or prospects booked on a call? Yes. Currently they come from YouTube. I think it's the best kind. I have some from Twitter as well, because Twitter, I have about 12,000 followers, which is pretty decent. Um, but I feel like YouTube is the best because people who are growing on YouTube, well, they're on YouTube. Yeah. Right. People, they're not necessarily on Twitter. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but I feel like because YouTube is the best because they, they find one of my videos, they like my videos, they like me, they subscribe, they binge watch a lot of stuff. So by binging, they have been exposed to my brand for a couple of hours. So they hear me talk, they hear me explain things, they hear me teach things. Right. So all of this is them getting couple of hours into my brand so I, I look at it like my my youtube videos are kind of pre-selling me as the 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 consultant or whatever so by the time they get on a call they have an expectation of who i am and what i can deliver and i get when i get on the call they just want to match you know what they think of me for my videos and the actual me and it, usually like okay I name your price you know what was the deal yeah nice this is interesting because we we've also kind of experienced the same where there's a lot of kind of YouTube growth strategists on YouTube, but there's very few on Twitter and even fewer on LinkedIn, uh, which is quite interesting. And it kind of makes sense that if you're, you would target your audience on the platform that you're actually growing. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your choice then to use Twitter over LinkedIn? Because if you're aiming at businesses, I'd say that there's more business owners on LinkedIn or... Um, Correct. Because that's um, where I'm growing, for example. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so I started Twitter originally because I was a blogger. I mean, so writing just makes sense to me at the time. Um, then my Twitter kind of blew up. But at the time, there was a lot of Malaysians that follow me. And there's no, no not, nothing wrong with that. But because at the time, I was doing personal finance for Malaysians. So obviously, my... My target, you know, my followers are Malaysian. But now that I'm going more international, so I have to switch only to English and only talk about YouTube, right? So for Twitter, I didn't start a new a new account because I felt I don't want to start so many new things. So I just rebranded myself for Twitter. Now LinkedIn, I I used a uh, um, it's kind of like a, a software for you for you to schedule out posts on mm-hmm. on on Twitter. So when it schedules out for Twitter, it also post it on LinkedIn as well together. Okay. Oh, okay. So, but from my point of view, my LinkedIn doesn't really work that well for, from, for me. I'm not saying that it doesn't work for you, but it just doesn't work for me. And I don't really like LinkedIn's vibe because there's a lot of people who are kind of corporate kind of, you know, because my target audience, mostly they're solo business owners and they're probably not hanging out on LinkedIn. So uh, the, the people who hang out on LinkedIn are corporate people, and they have their own vibe. You know, when you're corporate, you have to have all these lingo so you sound smarter than you are. And so if that's your target audience, you got to be on LinkedIn and talk like that. So to me, there's nothing more I hate than being that guy. So that's, therefore, I don't want to be so much on LinkedIn. Good. So you got to know your target audience is basically what I'm trying to say. Sure. I, I think I have a different experience on LinkedIn than you have. And like I tried both Twitter and LinkedIn 
to post. Um, and I see like the the vibe on LinkedIn is better than on Twitter. So it's funny that we have a, a opposite perspective there. Um, not so much corporate on LinkedIn always. Um, there is definitely a part of it. Uh, but I believe that LinkedIn is really growing, maturing in, in that part of the, the content process or the, the content sales funnel as well. I want to talk a little bit more about the experience you went through with the video that went viral because it's kind of insane. Like it's almost at 100K, what is super exciting. Um, yeah. Like probably when this episode is out, is 100K. So when you thought about that video, what was your initial thoughts on it? Was it like, okay, I'm just going to make it because this is like what I feel needs to be talked about or you knew that was going to be a big topic? Um, okay, so... Let's say your content funnel is ready, meaning you already have case studies, you already have how-tos. Now you want to venture into broad topics and trending topics. So how I got that video idea is to inspire other people. I'm just going to share. Is uh, I didn't really use any... I mean, there is tools like one of 10com for example. I think you know what that is, right? Uh, but if I'm honest, if you're a beginner, you, you you get that tool. You don't even know how to wrap your head around it. It, it. It's a tool. It's a very valuable tool. But I feel like you have to be quite experienced with YouTube to use that data to make a decision of what to do. So if a, if a newbie gets a type something, uh, like they can't like, what am I going to do with all these data? They, they don't know how to, you, you know, because you're a beginner. <laughs> so uh, what I did, how I got the video idea was that uh, on your YouTube channel, uh, you, you have your personal YouTube, right? Where you watch videos of whatever or songs. So keep your personal on one channel. And then I have another channel, which is my business channel, just about, me googling about stuff around my niche so what happens after a while like the youtube algorithm will only show stuff that is relevant to the, the stuff that i search which is my my niche right so it just happened that this one time i was on the home page of my uh, business channel and then this video popped up it was actually somebody else's video and he was a video editor and it was a brand new channel it was popping and i watched the video and it makes a lot of sense he just says Oh, you don't need... I mean, the, the, the basic message of the video is that you don't need to edit like Mr. Beast. You can get away by being uh, editing very simple, but being authentic. That That's the whole message, right? So it is it, it aligned with what I wanted to say as well. So I, I took the same concept. Okay, that's my message. You don't need to uh, edit like Mr. Beast. You can get away by, by editing very simple, but being super authentic. So I had the same message, but it was wrapped in my stories. Right? Because you can't just tell them that it's so boring. So I, I gave him my story, how I got, you know, my story, how I started. And then I gave my examples who inspired me. So it's 100% mine. But the message is the same, right? And then, you know, you take inspiration from thumbnails that work as well. So uh, it was a thumbnail. The guy was like with a cap, with a mic like this. So he's he looks like he's talking. He looks like an authority. You want to click on it. So I did something similar, but not exactly. I didn't copy him. So it was me with uh, holding my, 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 my laptop. And then there's some illustration at the back showing complicated and simple editing right so i use the concept that works but i added my own spin to it and that's what a lot of people don't know because a lot of people just copy you know and even when that when my viral video went with took off uh, i got a lot of copycats as well yeah i saw a few of those i think i mentioned uh, i think i forwarded one to you as well when i saw that yeah, yeah. So there's nothing you can do about it. And it's funny that one of the copycats actually emailed me to apologize. It was just hilarious. And because he probably got a lot of backlash on this video. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I'm pretty sure because on my on my comment, on my video, the one that we filed, they just say, hey, this guy literally copied you exactly. And, and then there's so many, so many guys say, hey, I just came from another video that copied your video, which is my video. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure he probably got a lot of comments. I don't I don't really look at his stuff, but I'm pretty sure he gets a lot of comments like that, maybe. So he probably I don't know. Well the interesting thing, thing too. Yeah. The interesting thing was that his video also really popped off on his channel. Yeah. And that was like, oh dang, like the that's where that indeed that the idea is definitely a viral one. Um, and I was even very tempted to like, mm, maybe we should like, we should like jump on this bandwagon. And <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the thing that I wasn't happy with is that he copied a little too much. Like the thumbnail was exactly the same. Yeah. The script also was the same structure. Um, yeah. And that inside, inside my video, I gave an analogy, like, okay, if you want to be comfortable in the camera, uh, imagine the camera, like you're sitting at a cafe with a friend and talk like, so that's my analogy. And he used something extremely similar. So I felt like that's just not cool. I mean, just 
come out with your own, put your own spin to it, you know? Yeah. Like uh, what I really liked about that video of yours is that, um, and what I realized that we do a lot as well is that we take our, ins- our inspiration of other creators, right? And that's what you put in that video. It's like, hey, like you don't need to edit like Mr. Beast, but check out this channel, check out this channel and check out this channel. And I think two out of three, I had no ideas when you shared that. And then maybe one I was familiar with. So this is where the, really the insights and the experience um, seeps through. And that was very interesting. And um, we do the same to our clients. Yeah, that's funny you say that because a lot of people also come and say, hey, I like to, it's very interesting that you shared who inspired you. So they like that because that, that shows that it's this is my personality, this is my experience. So they want to hear me, my experience, you know, so... And then I purposely don't pick somebody super famous, like Sam Sulek. Ooh. I mean, everybody's talking, come on, man, like, come on, man. have some personality. Which, I mean, I'm not, he's, he's amazing, but I know everybody's going to be saying about Sam. So I just want to pick somebody else so at least you can be exposed to these new creators that inspire me, right? And then the cool thing is that because I mentioned some of those creators, they, they kind of follow me back and then we kind of have some sort of, you know, yeah, direction. Yeah. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, one of the guys that I follow for that exact that was before your video actually is Amplify View. I forgot the, yeah. his name as well, but his video style is also or his channel is also about us, what we do, YouTube channel, so uh, YouTube funnel growth. And so um, he posted maybe less than ten videos, hit a ten k subscribers as well, um, but very like like anti-retention editing and that's what inspired me initially on that and then the thing is because we're editing for so many clients we need to convince them that like hey less is more and then they were like oh but we want more flashy stuff and so it's like really like educating them on what works um so that's very interesting i i think that 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 happens when the business owner is not the face of the channel i think that's that's when it happens which is why uh, I focused on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, it's not necessarily like this because we've been working with certain channels for so long. And then obviously you kind of ride the waves of what works and what doesn't work. Even like within business, within trying to have some viral content out. And retention editing had his, like it had his use, right? Like for uh, channels that are quite saturated you need to stand out in a way and so retention editing was part of it and so they were expecting more of that and now that people are getting sick of this type of content um yeah trying to slow it down now we're not going cold turkey immediately um because yeah, i yeah. think that would just be a too harsh of a cut on the brand yeah. of the channel itself so that's yeah. where i'm saying like you need to convince the, the the owners and the channel the business owners to look this is um what people prefer and rather than going chasing views we're chasing quality views and might be a bit less yep I, I really like the the style of video editing almost like loom videos where there's like a a circle with the face in the bottom yep. left or bottom right and then some kind of like framework that the person is going through um, i think like those type of videos are, are far more focused on providing value rather than trying to cover up that there's not that much video and not that much value through fancy editing. Yeah. So, uh, so to to get on that point is, so if your channel is about you, you have a clear audience who you're trying to help. So, your videos will be trying to help that audience, right? So the value of the video is what you're trying to explain in the video. It's either your you know step by step solution or your personal story to inspire the your target audience. Those are the one that connects with the audience. So I feel like the channels who focus too much on retention editing, either you are an entertainment channel or you don't really have anything interesting to talk about. That's why they have to rely on 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 this flashy editing because they don't really have anything. They don't really teach anything. So they have to, you know, do the retention editing. But if, if it's people like me, right, I'm documenting my journey. So the, the journey, the story itself is interesting. Therefore, you don't really need fancy editing because people want to hear my story. Because that's what they're there for, the story. The, I am the character. I'm taking the, the audience together along with me in the progression of this character. So the audience want to hear that. 
And I feel like the more re- relaxed, the more natural the conversation, like how I am in the, in the camera right now, the better it is. So I don't need none of the flashy editing. And that works for me. And this is what I tell my clients. And they like, you know what? Yeah, I want to do the same thing. Um, and so to round off that topic of the viral video, like obviously you got more clients out of it. Um, was that only initially uh, after the boost or is that now still providing you, let's say, dividends or residual um, effects uh, after that? Like because that video is on your channel, that is providing you enough credibility and all of that for continuous, continuously getting more clients. Uh, well, right now I'm kind of booked out for February because I want to maintain myself as a one man band. I, I mean, it's very easy to kind of accidentally, whoops, I'm an agency, right? <laughs> so, uh, I, I kind of enjoy just being like a one man. That's just what I want. And uh, there's nothing wrong with beca- becoming an agency. I just don't want to have staff and that kind of stuff. So I work with freelancers, uh, but no, I don't want any full-time staff. Uh, so right now I'm kind of booked out. Um, I do see that, you know, when you go viral, the views start to slow down after a while. So maybe I need to start working on my next thing, right? So the audience already kind of like me and uh, kind of like the, the persona that I portray on online. So naturally, they just want to see what, what's going to happen next. Sorry, uh, that's why I love that follow-up video you did. I was actually literally waiting for that video to come out. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, there you go. Um, and it was very natural and obviously it didn't do as well as the viral video, but still above average of the channel. So, um, and I know a lot of the, yeah. the people from that video went to that video as a, as like, what's going now? Yeah. Like what's happening now? Yeah. But it's also, uh, you mentioned that it didn't do very well, but okay. That's the other thing. Like you, you can't expect everything to go viral all the time, right? You, you got to keep, keep it real. So this is also what I show, share my, my, my clients as well. Look. I do this. It's a really great topic, but it doesn't mean that you have to go viral all the time because you, that's not what YouTube is about, right? You want to build that connection. And then I show them, here's the, here's the comments that I get from my videos. And they say they love me now. They binge watch all my videos. That's what you want, right? And then you get the book calls. That's what you want. So you want to build that, the, the connection. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic where you talked about you don't want to, uh, like build out an agency and start hiring full time. Uh, we had a Milan and I had a an interview with Jay Claus, the founder of Creator Science, and he's doing some pretty big numbers. He's scaling nicely, but we also had that discussion where he similarly doesn't want to hire full time and and kind of wants to stay as the kind of like a solopreneur. I I've made that mistake where like when my channel started to grow and I I started hiring very very quickly, and then after. Like six months a year, I was realizing I probably, my team is probably a little bit too big, and so we trimmed the team down. And now I'm I'm very much not not a solo entrepreneur, but I I'm very very cautious when it comes to hiring part time and full time. Uh, and I do like the flexibility of working with with freelancers. So so then my next question would be what how do you how do you plan to scale uh, becoming staying a, a solo entrepreneur? So your, the amount of money that you can charge a client is directly proportionate to the case, uh, sorry, social proof that you have. In, in other words, case studies. So if you can prove I help this guy make more money with YouTube or, or that person is super famous, the more you can charge. I mean, that's just how it is, right? So right now I'm just trying to build that case study, the, the, the pile of case studies that I have. So the more I can do that, the higher I can charge. And you, you need to set like, what is your happy number? You know, as a one man band, if I make, at the very minimum, five thousand a month. That's the minimum. Maybe ten thousand. I'm, I'm happy already. Like I don't. I don't need to make one million dollars. I don't. I don't have the desire to drive a Ferrari around. I mean, ask yourself like, well, what makes you happy? That doesn't make me happy. I just want to have a nice house, a uh, decent car, send my kids here and there. I'm done. That, that's it. That's that's a nice life for me, right? So in order for me to achieve that, I only need maybe four or five clients a month. That that I charge a couple of thousand dollars. So that's how I look at it. I just want to keep, you know, some clients very happy. They just keep along with me. If I need more clients, then maybe there's a wait list. I can, I can shoot out to those guys first. Hey, there's a opening slot next month. So I just want to keep my, myself at that level. There's nothing wrong with you doing, you know, becoming an agency. Um, on the topic of staff, because before this, I was a head of content. I was hired by that media company. Remember I told you the, the used car company? Yeah. So I came in 
having to manage a staff of seven editors and and kind of hosts like journalists. Um, so I felt like as a head of content, you don't really do the YouTube job, but it was more to kind of managing these adult children to behave every day. Yep. So I felt like there's no satisfaction for me at least because I wasn't really doing the actual YouTube thing. I, every day there was a political thing trying to get them on my side so for, so for them to do the thing that I want them to do. But they, they're not from YouTube, so they feel that it's their, their way is right, but my way, they don't think that my way is right. I think my way is right, and I have proof of it, but they feel like they're challenged. So there's a lot of this article thing. So I feel like I wasn't really doing the YouTube job. I was more towards managing, making them happy. That's a lot of work, man. So I feel like if I just hire a consultant or, or, or like a freelancer, like, hey, I need this thing done. Here's how much it costs. Get it done. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that's a little easier on me because I don't have to manage your emotion, your feelings, all that mm-hmm. stuff, you know? Yeah, I think... So that's my, that's my point of view. I think there's pros and cons for both. Um, we definitely yes, went through a hiring spree and regretted that uh, and then scaled back to then expand in the freelance world. We do have in-house, but we also have a whole network of freelancers. Um. No, yeah. I think that's a whole conversation by itself. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, a slight switch of topic. So, as we mentioned earlier, you, you're focusing, in, and so are we focusing not just on views, but also converting those views to meetings, books, to leads, to sales. Um, so, let's say that you get a client that wants you to work on their YouTube channel. And obviously you will help them with the editing and the thumbnail design and those kind of things. What if they also wanted help with booking more meetings, for example? How involved uh, would your company be in terms of the execution of improving the funnel? By the funnel, I mean like lead magnets, email lists, those kind of things. Do you work on the execution or do you just consult with that or do you uh, refer them to another agency? Well, um, right now, I, I can do it for them, but I don't have any clients who want that. But if they want to, that's why I have the discovery call because I wanted, where are you right now? So a lot of them like, okay, I already have everything. I just want you to scale my YouTube channel. So that's one type of client. And then there's there's another client like, oh, you know what? I want to start a YouTube channel. Then when I dig around, like, oh, you don't even have a landing page yet. So therefore, I create the landing page for them. And then after I'm done with that, then I can do work on their YouTube. And then some other people, they don't, like you said, they don't have a landing page. Sorry, they don't have a lead magnet. They don't have a email, whatever. Then I can charge something else before I, I work on the, uh, the YouTube channel. And I noticed that there's actually a lot more people at the very, very beginning say they don't even have an offer. So an offer is, what is your high ticket offer that you're selling? Like for me, I'm selling this YouTube thingy. This is a service, right? It's a high ticket service. For them, they don't even have that thing. They just say, oh, I want to make money from YouTube. Then I ask them, okay. What are you selling? You don't have, you don't have anything. You don't even have a landing page. You don't have nothing. So maybe then I can sell them like a consultation package. And a lot of these guys, they just want to talk really, you know, they have an idea that, but they need somebody with experience to kind of pinpoint them and, and direct them in some sort of direction that makes sense. So, so I, I, I did a lot of consultation from that viral video. Um, I just finished the last one today. It was very tiring, awesome. but quite Money. fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. Mike does all our consultation calls, but the the inter I, I remember that I was also involved. We did like hundreds of them a few months ago, and um, the interesting part is you get really an insight into someone else's thought process on YouTube, exactly, and also yep. like um, their business, right? And then the more you do of those, so um, yeah, it's very interesting to to just focus on that rather than trying to lock them in as a high ticket offer immediately. Cool. Um, really appreciate you coming on. Um, it was very insightful. Um, where can people find you um, if they want to check you out more? Okay, so you can find me on YouTube and also Twitter. That's where I'm most active. So I'm going to share the link with Milan. Milan's going to put it on the video somewhere. Yes, we will indeed. Cool. Thank you so much, Helmi, for joining us on the Playstech podcast. Yeah, thank you, Helmi. Thank you for having me.